Hi guys, how everyone's been doing today? Yay, I like that enthusiasm from the get-go. It's almost like we've got a pile of incredibly rare retro things for you to look at. Who would have thought that would go down well here? But thank you all for coming along, and today we have a guest with us, which is known to many of you, who is Sobi Kwang DX. Please welcome him to the stage. Hello. How are you doing today? All right. Doing good, doing good. Quang already being distracted by his own collection of retro things there. I, I don't get to see them that much. They're normally in storage. Yes, Quang is quite well known with the the community. He has been collecting retro for 20 years now and has one of the largest, most complete boxed collection of retro consoles. I'm going to say in the universe, it's um, probably the world, definitely Europe, um, but we'll go for the universe, I think, just for... Yeah, let's yeah. make it big. Universe. Yeah, we, we might as well. Go for the full hype. I think we will in this case. And I don't think anyone can prove that it isn't the universe. Um, I'll say that and a spaceship will just immediately land in the ground and point out they've got one more console that was only released on Jupiter and the whole thing will be blown out of proportion. But assuming that doesn't happen, I think we can clearly say you've got one of the largest retro collections going on planet Earth. Um, and as well as that, Quang is known for being a Game Boy developer. Yeah. That's one of the things I did. Having worked in the tech industry. Yes. Making retro t-shirts that we are both sporting. Oh, yeah, yeah, that too. Being a break dancer, because why not? And, uh, yeah, and the aforementioned retro collection. All of these things, apart from the break dancing, which needs no explanation because that's just cool, all of these things are connected by a, a love and a joy for technology and gaming. How did that start? Where did your joy of gaming start? Um, I guess memories of gaming start with the Atari 2600. Who had one of those? A few years, yeah. Yeah, lots of love to you. 2600. Yeah, um, so playing that, playing combat. Um, my dad had got us for the family, and me and my brother just play that all the time. We love that to pieces. And then I guess moving on from that, the click of vision, and then throughout the ages. Yeah, and just continue to love gaming. And from that point, you set your sights on becoming a, a Game Boy developer. Um, yeah, it was, it was one of those things. So I started learning programming on the ZX Spectrum. Uh, on the one, had one to 8K plus. Um, learned Spectrum Basic on that. Then upgraded to an Atari ST and learnt DOS basic on that. And then finally got a, my first PC, which was a 386 laptop, and um, learnt C. And from there, learnt Game Boy programming. There was a, an SDK release called GBTK, and I learnt C and Z80 assembly. Um, and there were emulators were starting up, so we could make stuff on your, on your laptop. And then you got flashcards, and you play them on the real hardware, and it was very cool stuff to make Game Boy games. Yeah, and you actually work professionally in the industry developing some games. I think you've got a couple of the games that you yeah. contributed to here with you as well. Yeah, so um, we, I was lucky enough, I, I made a port of Jetpack on the Game Boy, um, and that was quite well recognised, and it actually got me a job working for a small company called Graphic State, and we got the licence to do the Lego racing game, uh, Lego stunt rally game. Um, so about 90% of the code in here is my code, which is quite cool. Nice to see the stuff on the cartridge. Yeah, and it must have been a wonderful feeling to have dreamt of programming for the Game Boy, because I know that's one of your, your favourite consoles. Uh, Tetris Champion and Street Fighter Champion, by the way. Just to add those into the list. I, there may be more things that get added to this list as I go on, because there's too many to have just listed at the beginning, or that would have been the whole talk. And <laughs> how did it feel to, to sort of... How would childhood you have, have felt seeing that, that you'd moved into actually developing these Game Boy games? Um, yeah, it's it one of those... Things, you know, ever since I was a kid and played with computers, I wanted to be a game programmer and make video games. And then to see your game on a actual console, on a Game Boy, it's just <laughs> Yeah, so cool. Literally blew your mind. And at that point, had you already started collecting as well, or did you not know it was um, collecting? Yeah, it started off, like, you get your consoles that you got on as you're growing, growing up, and I, I, I like holding on to stuff, and I like the boxes they come in, so... Everything I had, I kept the boxes for them and held on to them. Uh, I guess in 2000 or so, um, I had amassed a sizable collection already through just buying consoles. Uh, we went from, from uh, sort of Atari through Spectrum ST, uh, then Game Boys, Atari. We had, my brother had the Lynx, my other brother had the Game Gear. So, um, then we had a Super Nintendo, and it, I got a Sega Saturn, and it just kind of added up to that. And then I said, fell in love with the Game Boy, obviously, I started programming for it, so I got a vast array of Game Boys. And then people started noticing that 
out of the Sega and Nintendo, I had the majority of the consoles. Uh, and so it became a collection, and then it kind of snowballs from there. Yeah, I hear this a lot from people that are prolific retro collectors. It's basically their hoarders that got out of hand. Um, <laughs> and I, I've seen pictures of, of your house, which effectively just looks like this. There's, I, there's barely any furniture. There's no people in there. It is, is just effectively this. Would it be okay to say that you can't currently sleeping in your own bedroom in your house because of the amount of consoles in there? That's correct. It is correct. I, probably I actually sleep in the spare room at the moment because my main room's full of stuff. It, um, it is terrifying and incredible because you walk in there and you are unsure if you're going to be crushed by boxes of millions of incredible things. And is that an okay way to go? Yes. So, <laughs> so this, this photo here um, is actually made up of multiple photographs. Each segment is a crate that I keep the consoles in. Um, I don't actually have, to have enough space because I live in London, there's no space in London um, to display them, which is sad. But uh, each crate has one console. This photo was taken in 2015, the end of 2015, and that was five years ago. And my console's collection has grown sizably since then. I'm currently at over 230 odd box consoles, unique. So I, 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 let, me, let me clarify it, clarify this. So everything I collect has to be have changeable games, so either cartridges or CDs. So something like the Ouya doesn't count. It's all the digital downloads. I'm not, I'm not really a big fan of digital downloads. I, I want physical media. Um, it also has to be an, an official release. So uh, none of these Japanese Famicom clones. I don't click Famicom clones or Pong clones because obviously they don't have changeable media. And there's thousands of those. And I'm not going to go down that route. Um, yeah, it's probably best you, you don't <laughs> go down that route. You'd need to buy a bigger house. Also, because uh, it has to be, I want the box as well, it has to be an official release. So prototypes don't count either. Uh, although, as, uh, if anyone wants to lend me a, a million to buy the Super Nintendo PlayStation, I won't say no to that. But because it wasn't officially released, I'm not actively looking to collect that. Um, so everything here is a unique release. Um, I don't collect color variations, because for me it's the same console, so the pink Hello Kitty Dreamcast is the same as a regular Dreamcast. Don't mention that, you know that's a sore spot, I couldn't buy that. Uh, but the N64 comes in many, many different colors, um, so they don't count, but the N64 Pikachu version is physically a different console. So that counts as a separate console. So there's 230 odd unique consoles in my collection that are not a variation of another one. Uh, if you add variations, because I have many Game Boy variations too, you're probably looking at 300 plus very easily. I've not counted it, I should count that. I don't know, I mean, we once did a live stream where we unboxed just the non-Nintendo based handheld consoles and two hours later, there was still more. Yes, um, so it, those of you who know handhelds, you know the Game Boy, and on Nintendo's handouts, you know Sega did a few, you know Atari did a few. You have no idea how many more there are that aren't Sega, Nintendo, and Atari. And many of them are very, very bad. <laughs> They're all bad. The Game.com is a, is, a, is a wonderful machine. So there's three <laughs> variations of the Game.com. And there didn't need to be one. There's the original, there's the pocket, and there's a pocket with a backlight. <laughs> well, it's just it's a little got bowl. one LED. It's... it's <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a very unhappy little device. It, it wants to be a games console. It's basically half PDA. But yeah, so, so collecting has <laughs> sent me down this route of finding out about new consoles and you post about them and you think you know about all the consoles that were out there. And then someone goes, oh, do you have um, a Koei Passy Paso Go? And you go, what's a Koei Passy Go? So you go and search about it and, and you find out another console. So you've added that to your list. And between, I guess, 2010, 2010, and now, there were so many added to my list, many Japanese ones. Um, Mr. Alan Chang, who's here, introduced me to Yahoo Japanese auctions, <laughs> and then all my money went away. Yeah, I, I feel like he's an enabler. Because <laughs> <laughs> the number of Japanese consoles that we never saw is in, immense. I should, be able to change, I should change slides, actually. This is me sorting through the, the consoles in my garden, because I don't have enough space yeah. in my house to go through them. Because um, every time you add a new console, you need to make a find a space, find a crate for it to go in. Mm -hmm. um, it's a beautiful sight. <laughs> of course, you know, um, there, there was once grass and greenery and things, and it has all now been replaced with electronics, quite rightly so. 
So at what point, I feel like saying at what point did you realize this has got completely out of hand? Um, but also, at what point, we'll word it nice, at what point did you realize you had moved from hoarder into professional collector? At what point did you actually actively start saying, this is now a collection and I am trying to complete this? So I think in 2011 or 2012, there about, I had 75 consoles and I thought, I must have nearly all of them by now. I must be so close. Oh no. So I thought maybe, the, maybe, maybe there's a hundred variation consoles out there or so. And yeah, I thought I must be close to that. And so now I'm a collector. And then obviously you find out more and it's, I'm at 2.30 now and I reckon there's probably another 50 odd or so before I actually can come close to finishing. There are so many out there. And then somebody will start sending him links to even more obscure ones. And I've learned a lot just, just from walking around um, <laughs> my poor friend's house. I've learned a lot of consoles I never knew existed. Um, and you also have taken a lot of these consoles. That's one of the things about your collection is um, these aren't just things that sat sealed in a box and no one ever touches them. Quang has been kind enough to share his collection with a lot of events. So some of the previous like play events and other events you've been to, those ridiculously rare things where you walk past and you go, what is, is that a DVD player? Is, is that a boombox? Is, is that a sticker machine? Is that lost? And you turn and find out that's a console. These often have belonged to, to Quang. So you make sure these stay working, you make sure these stay played and stay yeah. loved, presumably because that's how you feel consoles should be. Oh, for sure. A console are made to be played. So um, you can see up there, I'm holding the Telstar Arcade, which is the weird triangle console here. I bought this sealed. It's, a sim uh, it's nearly as old as I am. It's, it's a 40-year-old console. And I broke the seal on live stream because it's meant to be played. Um, and <laughs> oh, we're getting! I was worried at that point we were going to need to duck and run. Okay, we're getting cheers. That's good. Um, <laughs> but obviously, a lot of consoles are old and they're dying, and their capacitors leak everywhere. So I employed the services of th this gentleman down here, Simon Locke, who's a wizard at repairing things, and he's made I'm sure a lot of these things live and are able to be played. Uh, if you've been to Play Expo in Manchester or Blackpool or Revival. Um, You've possibly played one of my consoles uh, in the rare section because, um, yeah, I, they need to be played and I don't have time to play them and they're usually in storage. So the only time they do get played is when I take them out to events. So uh, hopefully you've enjoyed them. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things about collectors like yourself is you, you are not just collecting them to hoard them, you are collecting them to share them and to help people learn about things. I've learned about so many things I never knew existed. Um, I got to play Tempest 3000 on a new one um, against Ashens, and it's the only game I've ever won against him, so I was quite pleased with that. And, but I'd never even heard of it before that point, and I'm a massive fan of, of Tempest 2000, so finding out there was another version that effectively was on a DVD player was quite interesting. And sharing those things with the world and also preserving those things is a conservation act. And that's one of the things I don't think people really understand about collectors is you're also preserving and conserving these things for future generations. Yeah, for sure. One of the big things I say in the back in the box is, is many collectors just collect the machines. Yes, it's a lot easier and a lot cheaper, and which I, I wish I'd start doing that. But It's too late now. I'm down the road where I'm collecting boxes. Um, but the boxes are a huge part of preserving the history. Um, when you're a kid and you're in the store, you can't buy every console, so you look at the beautiful boxes on the shelves and someone took time and effort to, to design boxes. And the, the, you can see when they're 70s, 80s and 90s, you can see the design changes and it's amazing. Yeah, and sometimes they are very of their time. And sometimes when the boxes are terrible, that also tells you something. The game.com again, the packaging for that's beautiful. The logo is, is, <laughs> it looks like a web URL and is not. And, and seeing those things and seeing how those designs evolve, again, is another part of our gaming history. It isn't just about the games, they're incredibly important. But even just the packaging, the instruction manuals, the way things are worded, the brilliant instructions where they're explaining how to plug something into the back of your television, those things make up part of our nostalgia, part of our history, and um, walk hand in hand with the actual development of the consoles themselves. How, how many out there would class yourself as a collector? How many would class yourself as a hoarder who's desperately trying not to be a collector? <laughs> There's a few more hands. Yeah, yeah, I can see a few more. Yeah, this is the path you're on. This is your future back garden. If you don't have a back garden to start saving now, you're going to need one. Um, so, yeah, my bedroom currently looks like this. There is a bed under there somewhere, I presume. So that's the edge of my bed starting there, yeah. and it goes that way. Um, that's my floor, and right at the top there, there's the ceiling. So literally, it's floor to ceiling. We can see a bit of floor. Yeah. How long ago was this photo taken? Is that floor still there? Mm, yeah. He's not sure. 
Um, so these crates are made by really useful boxes, and this is the largest crate they do. It's 184 liters. It's, it's massive. Pure console goodness. They're about <laughs> this size. <laughs> um, and uh, there is 20 of these crates, um, and there's also stuff that doesn't fit in the crates. You can see a Divers 2000 series there, and above that, the PC Engine monitor uh, above that. Uh, because some of these consoles aren't just a small console in a box. Some of them are built into screens. The yeah. The, this, the, this, this one here is... Uh, Have you spotted that in that photo? No, no, this, that, that, that's a Fanboy uh, Twin. That's, this is a Game Boy Advance that uh, is only in uh, cars. It's an in-built system for cars. Um, and this was donated to me, this was beautiful. Panasonic Q and a bunch of others. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's, my, that's my bedroom. Yeah, this is, this is a lot of people here, you're looking at your future. It, it is glorious, but we may find you several years later under a pile of boxes just lying there saying, it was worth it, <laughs> when they all come crashing down. Um, but it is an incredible, beautiful collection, and we do massively appreciate the fact that you share these things with us, and that you've brought some super rare things here with you as well, all, yeah. fully, working, all fully working consoles. Have you got anything here which is, apart from the, the Game Boy games you worked on, obviously, mm. is any of the ones here something that you were, had tried to find for a long time and incredibly proud to have for obtained? For sure. Um, so this is the Entex Adventure Vision. Um, this is... I'm going to pass this over to you to handle. Oh, should I model it? Do you, do you want to know how much it costs? <laughs> Is this one of those things where you hand me something and then I'm terrified? Um, maybe, I don't know. Uh, so this is an ex incredibly expensive hobby. Um, but I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I don't um, Th gamble. This is better. <laughs> many things. This is where all my money goes. Uh, and th yeah, some of, the, some of the rarer stuff gets very, very expensive, especially in its box again. And... I got lucky with quite a bunch of stuff, so I didn't pay as much as this is worth. This was bought as broken, um, but I got it home and it was working, so score. I'm now holding this gently as if it were a newborn, um, because I fear I may be holding more than my yearly income's worth of money in, in the form of plastic and capacitors. <laughs> so if you... He's not correcting me, I'm no. going to hand it back. <laughs> If you know how the console, um, the Virtual Boy screen works, it's actually a line of LEDs um, and a spinning mirror, um, which refreshes very, very quickly and displays it. This is the same thing. This is a line of 15 LEDs and a mirror. I believe Octavius did a video on this. Um, I yeah, I think it. she did. So um, Octavius and Top Hat over there have known a few of my consoles and done wonderful videos on them. They do so much research and tell me things about things my, my, about my own consoles that I don't know. So it's I think you wonderful. also deserve kudos for the fact that a lot of the retro YouTubers that, that you know and that you are going to see on panels here later today borrow Quang's consoles. So the, these are very famous consoles. They've been in far more videos than we ever have. And he does share them with other YouTubes so that they can share their knowledge and their enthusiasm for these as well. Because some of them are incredibly rare. What would you say the rarest thing you own is? That's quite tough to say. It's, it's either... Because some things are rare, but they show up enough that you could buy one. Mm. But there are things that are not maybe not expensive, but they never ever show up. Mm. Um, the the brown box, the Diver 2000, is a Dreamcast TV. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's like it looks like a big space helmet in blue. It has a Dreamcast uh, flip top lid and yeah. it plays it's Dreamcast games. It's effectively a CRT that looks like if Sonic the Hedgehog were a space helmet, and it has a Dreamcast in the top oh, of it. I can show you these. Um. These are Super Famicom SF1s. These are, <laughs> these are CRTs with Super Famicom built into them. This is, the, the, up front is the two 14 inches and back is the 21 inch screens. Um, I now have six of these sitting at home. Um, I, I got kind of addicted to them. <laughs> yeah, so the, what, two at the back of the big ones, two to the front. You can see how much space there is between the plastic edge and, and, the, and the port. I think generally any, any question where it is, is does Quang own every variation of it? Yes. <laughs> it's going to be the way. Who wants to name a console and see if I have it? <laughs> we can play this game. PV1000. So, yeah. PV1000. I took it along to uh, Revival. 
Who else? Anyone going to name a rare console? Want to try? <laughs> so that's one of, the, one of those I don't want to own. It's the Iowa Boombox Mega Drive, because that's ridiculously rare. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It is a boombox with a Mega Drive in it, <laughs> which I don't know who thought of it, but they were a genius. The problem is, is like, it's, it's trying to find that one in its box. It's, it's almost impossible. I've only seen it once in its box, so that's one definitely one of the holy grails I'm after. Um, the PC Engine LT down the end is a wonderful PC Engine, which I picked up in Japan. I went to Japan for a friend's wedding, and I decided once I'm over there, I'm going to buy some consoles because I'm here. I went over there with just a backpack, and then I came back with two full suitcases full of stuff. Did you make it to the wedding? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I just checking. <laughs> went to the wedding first and then went uh, shopping. That's the way to do it. Yeah, two large consoles. Um, I picked up that, um, the Wonder Mega 1 and Wonder Mega 2, uh, a Geo RX PC Engine, and a few other things. But it was wonderful to be able to pick that up in Japan, which is great stuff. Uh, talk about Game Boys, that Game Boy up there is my first Game Boy, so, which, it, which is nice to have. So we we have a heckler, they've mentioned the Vega so, Plus, yeah, and it less. slopes games room. <laughs> Vega Plus doesn't count. <laughs> Is that just in general, because it's digital downloads? For, for various reasons, one, uh, it doesn't count. <laughs> 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 but, uh, um, but you asked about the Tech Toy uh, Girl, which is like a, one, it's like a Mega Jet, but, but Master System version of it, made by Tech Toy. I don't have one yet. Uh, one came up online. Points uh, to the person in the front row. Not in a box, <laughs> totally trashed, and that sold for nearly a hundred pounds, in like it was trashed. Um, so I got, you know, I can't even think how much it would cost to get one in its box, uh, new. But it's it's on the list. It's good, good, cool. And that's one of the things of retro collecting is that it's gained popularity. You've been collecting for twenty years. Um, and obviously, as it's gained momentum, in some ways that's been wonderful because it means more people are part of the retro community. We get incredible events like Play Expo now are very popular and growing in size because we are all now enjoying the love of these consoles, more retro collectors appearing. But for someone who is hoarding one or, or six, collecting. apparently... Oh, hoarding, collecting. Collecting. Sorry, sorry. Um, Freudian slip there. <laughs> all of these things. You're watching the, the marketplace, the prices and the availability and things change. How has your experience as a collector um, changed and evolved over the last 20 years? For sure, you've seen that obviously the prices, prices of things shoot up. Uh, I used to collect games as well, so Game Boy games, PC Engine, and Sega Saturn, they, they were my loves. Um, and then games got, got ridiculous. I think I paid over 500 for a Game Boy game, and that was kind of the, the breaking point of like, what the hell am I doing? Um, so as long as I have the hardware, I'm happy with that. The games, I can work out different ways. There are flashcards, there are um, obviously emulators and things like that. You can play the games, but the hardware is something that needs to be, uh, uh, has to be kept. Um, yeah, there are the quite price a few just, game collectors out there that you can borrow games from. Hopefully, I think we're at the point where Quang has lent everyone so many consoles, they're willing to lend him a few games in return. Yeah. Uh, what are the pictures have we got from? Yeah, so um, I, I wanted to just want I to show you. I've seen these pictures before, so I'm as interested in you guys. So uh, yeah, so the Super Famicom, Famicom TVs uh, became sort of an obsession to my, for me because I saw it ages ago in I think it's Me Machines magazine, the or maybe CV, CVG, and um, I thought I really want one of those, and then it never happened, and I completely forgot about it. And then I went Six to Mark, I went to a London game market once, and the Alan had one on show, and. <laughs> Um, it just reignited this love for this. He told me about your Japanese auctions, and then I've been hunting them down feverishly since then. And it's a weird gamble shipping them over because shipping a CRT from Japan to the UK, it's very likely going to be broken when it arrives. And now you, you sort of gamble paying a bunch of money, and then you hope it turns up in working in one piece. And it's quite a buzz when it does work, and it's quite sad when it doesn't. Um, I think I have a problem. But so I, I took these um, out for a little drive. This is a family outing. <laughs> um, so there's two over there. Tucked in and with seatbelts. Two, two over there. Books to read. They were happy. Yeah. Um, always wear your seatbelt. 
Um, don't put your kids on the floor, though. Yeah, it's slightly That's different to, to real children. Don't actually stack them That's fine. in That's fine. the boot. That's fine. Um, <laughs> so we took them to go, to, to go get looked over because, uh, again, the machines are old, so they need repairing. And then we tell them a little story. <laughs> if anyone was ever in doubt of, of, of Quang's love for his consoles. Can you see what I'm reading? It is the Spectrum Plus 2 Blueprint. So it's, it's the circuit for the power circuit. So, you know, they need to know all these stuff. They're, they're coming over from Japan. They don't know about UK stuff. So you can tell, <laughs> tell them these stories. Um, we were going from very impressed by the collection to slightly worried at this point. <laughs> You've got to have fun with it. You've got to enjoy it. And I'm going to end, end on that. So part of collecting consoles is also cleaning the stuff around consoles as well. And you end up with plushies like this. Um, this is only available in Jap was only available in Japan. Um, I picked two of these up. I don't know where the second one is. Like I said, you're looking after one at the moment, Bex. Uh, one of them is currently being fostered by me and is in the background for my live streams and is called Monty the Mega Drive. It's, it's an incredible plushie because it has controllers for hands and also I'm, I'm probably, uh, you that, can't see it on the foot, yeah. it, His foot is, is a plug. It's a power supply, yeah. Um, and it's lovely to see the, the, the detail and the love put into these things. Um, obviously, with the console collection, I'm assuming you're trying not to buy plushies of every single console as well, or is this just the next step? Have you seen the, the, the new... So New Geo released the New Geo Mini. Uh, it looks like a mini arcade cabinet. It's a terrible console, but... Um, but you still have to have it. No, because it doesn't have changeable games. So you're safe. <laughs> uh, but they released a plushie of it. Did anyone see that? The, the giant plushie. It's like this big, and it has handholds, so you can hug it, and, and you can use it as a pillow. I kind of want that. Is that because there's no space to put a bed in your bedroom anymore? Yeah, yeah. You're just going to hug a plushy arcade cabinet and have an existential crisis. <laughs> For sure. It's, um, yeah, it's a, I don't have a problem, honestly. It's, it's just... It is, it's not a problem because partly we all get to play these consoles and get to enjoy them at these events, so we're exceptionally happy that this is continuing. <laughs> we'll leave a picture of Monty up. Does anyone have any questions they would like to ask Quang about his collection? Shall I bring a mic down? I'm going to now jump off the stage. If you never see me again, you know that went wrong. Yay! <laughs> Hello, a very impressive collection. Um, do you count the At Games Mega Drive because they are officially released? <coughs> Does anyone count that one? Dirty. Um, <laughs> so that, do I, can you, I do actually have one. Um, and it takes cartridges, and it's an officially licensed product. Um, but Sega literally gave their brand away to pretty much anyone who would make something with it. And I personally do not count the Sega at games things as consoles that need to be need to be collected. But you still have one. I, I do have one. Right. Okay. Just just to clarify that you do still have one, despite the fact you've just said. It doesn't count, and you're only buying things that count. Just, we'll just, we'll just leave that hanging slightly awkwardly. Does anyone else have a question? So does the Neo Geo X count? Yeah. So once again, the Neo Geo X is lovely. I think it's quite a nice console. Um, it's basically a, a dingu in a very nice case. I thought the handheld was really well made. Again, it doesn't take technically take cartridges. It takes SD card flashes, and they have various things on it. Um, so but it doesn't do technically count, but do you have one? But I have one, yeah. Okay, right, okay. <laughs> I see a theme emerging. Does anyone over this side have a question they'd like to pose? <laughs> anyone else? Hey, right at the back. Hello, sir. <laughs> Out of your collection, what's the most played that you've done? Which one would you say you've played the most out of your collection? Um, so I played personally or...? Yep, you personally. But, uh, my Game Boy Color. <laughs> so my Game Boy Color... Did I bring it? Yeah, this one here. This is my first Game Boy Color, and this is the console I used to develop on and make games on. And that, yeah, um, I love the Game Boy. It's such a wonderful console. Uh, last month I played Warlocked on Game Boy Color. It's, it's a, it's a real-time uh, strategy game, kind of like Warcraft, but on the Game Boy. And it's a beautiful game, really well done. And I played that from start to finish. And yeah, handheld gaming for me is perfect because I travel a lot and I don't have much time to play stuff. So to, to, to actually play something, I need to um, 
literally get it out of a crate and that the time it takes to yeah, get something out. this is not that portable. Um, you know, so if I wanted to play a Neo Geo CD, I need to go dig through a crate, find it, and find the games, and then play it. But with a Game Boy, I can literally have it in my pocket and take it and play. So the Game Boy gets all the love, for sure. And we're seeing, I mean, even with modern gaming, things like the Switch are getting an incredible amount of love, and portable gaming and mobile phone gaming and things are making gaming a lot more accessible um, because everyone is busy. And um, quite frankly, where would you set these up in your house? Because there is no room for furniture. Does anyone else have a question they'd like to pose to Quang? You didn't actually say how much the Adventure Vision was that you paid for. Yeah, how much did that cost what I was just holding there? So if you look online and try to buy one, uh, you probably won't find one. Um, but if you do find one, you're probably looking in upwards of 1,500 unboxed. Yeah, I'm not going to be holding that again. Does anyone else have a question they'd like to ask? But pose? that's not why I paid for it. Uh, which console has been the hardest to maintain and keep running for you? Very good question. I would, I would actually say, uh, Simon, um, which has been the hardest to maintain? Simon, yeah. Probably, probably laser active. The la oh, the laser active. The, the packs. Yeah. yeah, so if those of you who don't know, the laser active is a giant laser disc player which has two add-ons for it that plays Mega Drive games and PC Engine games, and each one of them has hundreds of capacitors that need to be replaced, otherwise they leak everywhere and damage them and just eat the machine alive. The mechanical mechanism for the, the disc um, load is, it loads small CDs and full inch, 12-inch uh, laser discs. It's a wonderful dual system, uh, over-engineered, and it's just wonderful, but it breaks, and it, uh, but wonderful Simon has, has brought it back to life, and yeah, they are not easy to fix. Yeah, I think a lot of these old consoles, people didn't know that anyone was still going to be playing them 20 odd years later, so they weren't necessarily built to survive for that length of time. Did I, I see I, another question? I would ask here? how many of you have a Game Gear or Lynx that no longer works because it needs oh, new yes, capacitors? Every Game Gear needs new <laughs> capacitors, that's the first thing you have to do. Um, I'm going to assume you've played thousands of games, so I'm curious, what is your favourite genre and your favourite game in that genre? So I, I don't discriminate with games. I, I'll, play, I'll play anything bad and good. Um, so genre-wise, I, I wouldn't say I have a favourite genre. Um, my top three games, for those that want to know, uh, number one is Tetris on the Game Boy. Mm -hmm. uh, for sure, it's... There's so a lot of people nodding with approval there. <laughs> it's the purest game I, I know. It, 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 it doesn't need fancy graphics or fun uh, special effects. It's a great game. Uh, I play a lot of Tetris 99 of late. Um, playing Invictus and, and, and getting Maximus on that is, is, is exhilarating. Really difficult, but it's so much fun. Uh, I played in the Tetris Classic um, Qualifier in, in Germany. Uh, I managed it top eight, but... Uh, bottom of top eight, but still top eight. Um, Tetris is them probably my favorite. Second will be Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo uh, on the arcade. Um, I played a lot of Street Fighter 2 uh, competitively, and that's for me my favorite Street Fighter for sure. Yeah. And the third would be Castlevania Rondo of the Blood on the PC Engine. It's the last Castlevania that was a sideways platformer before it went Metroidvania. Don't get me wrong, Symphony of Night is a wonderful game. Uh, Aria of Sorrow is incredible, but there's something about the, the fine-tuned, hand-designed levels of uh, Rondo of the Blood was just beautiful. Yeah, and you mentioning Street Fighter has reminded me uh, of the story of um, how you became so good at playing Street Fighter and where you were playing the arcade machines. <laughs> so yeah, um, Street Fighter players, I've met many people who play Street Fighter and say they're really good at the game, and you think, great, someone to play with, someone to challenge, and you play them, and they're not very good, to be honest, because they've only played against their friends, and you're only as good as the people you play. So I spent a lot of time playing in the arcades, and I would travel to as many arcades as I can to play different people, because you get a wide range of players, and you play against the best versus the best. People leave their homes and play you there. Um, many times I would go to... Uh, either Trocadero or Casino Leisure on Tom Cook Road and you spend your money playing games. Again, you're playing for money, so um, you play to win. And you get to the point where it's the end of the day and you have just enough money to get the bus fare home and you need to decide, 
do I take the bus or do I pay for one more game? And it's always one more game. <laughs> and you, I, I'd walk the three, three miles home. But yeah. Yeah. Um, I also know that you uh, used to go ice skating. Um. <laughs> yeah, so where I live, um, it's quite close to the ice skating rink, and I used to go ice skating once a week, and they had arcades in the ice rink. So you go there, you put your boots on, and then you go play the arcades. <laughs> so if anyone can picture a younger Quang wearing ice skating boots, having told his family he's going ice skating, standing in said boots in the small arcade section of an ice rink, playing endless games of Street Fighter 2. I think that's dedication. Yeah, I got my priorities straight. Yeah. It's, it's one of the things that, in Street Fighter 2, is like, once you get to a certain level, you start beating people, and it's quite satisfying winning. I'm, like, I'm not saying I'm, I'm competitive, but I do enjoy winning. <laughs> Jim has <Yeah>. a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll pop down one second. Here we go. What's your question, sir? Chica Chrissy here. Um, is there a character that you main in Street Fighter 2? So, so he's asking, you know, yeah, which is my main character. So I can play all the characters really well because a big part of being a Street Fighter player is you play everybody so you learn the weaknesses and strengths. But my main is Zangief, uh, which I play a lot of. Um, just because back then, no one really knew how to play with a character that was that slow, without fireballs. Um, needs to be up and close. Um, now, uh, gra grapplers is part of parcel of fighting games, but back then it was just hilarious to beat people up with Zangief, and people were like, "Why are you picking him? He's rubbish, isn't slow." And then you beat them, and I, I play one-handed sometimes. Um, Whilst also on the phone with the other hand, having a conversation and also DJing, probably. If if, <laughs> if you hold the joystick in your pinky and you can use your thumb to hit buttons, you can play Street Fighter one-handed in the arcades and to beat people with that, who just slated your main character as being rubbish, it's quite satisfying. Yeah. So you're not competitive, but you learned to be good enough at playing a character no one else wanted to play in Street Fighter that you could control the arcade with one hand just to teach them a lesson. Like I said, I enjoy winning. <laughs> yeah, just, just, just clarifying, that's fine. While I'm down here, is there any more questions? Uh, at the back there. I'll run. Are you working on any games yourself right now? And if so, where could they find them? Nicely leading us into the next section. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers, Dan. I pre appreciate the segue. Cheers, Dan. Good. It's a seamless segue. We completely planned that. It's wonderful. So, yeah, as a game developer, I wanted to do that as a kid, and now I develop indie games. If you go over to the indie section on the other side, uh, there's some wonderful indie games, including mine, which is Mau Mau Castle. It's, it's a game about a flying cat dragon who chases rainbows. Um, those of you who are fans of Space Harrier will recognize it as a my love letter to Space Harrier and all things 90s. Um, I grew up playing arcade games in the 90s and they're my favorite, so let's make a game about that sort of stuff. Yeah, because you evolved from being someone who played games to someone who developed for the Game Boy. You then take a break from game developing and then have come back in, because we have an incredible indie scene in this country, um, and especially with the, the retro-styled games, there are some incredible, incredible developers putting together some incredible things, and it is a wonderful community to be part of. And you've always been quite central to, to the community that I have seen. Oh, for sure. I, uh, community is, is, is everything. The retro community is, is wonderful. Um, so replay events, uh, Andy, who runs this, uh, um, has been wonderful in fostering a strong connection with the indies. Um, if you go to any replay events uh, event, you'll have indie developers there showing their games. Um, and it's, it's wonderful, especially when a lot of the indie games are retro-inspired. Mm. Um, or sometimes run on retro hardware. We have things like Tanglewood, which is a game written in assembly, which runs on a Mega Drive. You can also get it on Steam and things like that, but that runs on a Mega Drive. So there is a, a lot of homebrew games being developed now for the old consoles as well. So there is this huge crossover between indie and retro gaming as well. And of course, your game is inspired by by retro gaming and is beautiful, pixelated. It's got flying cats and rainbows. I mean, what more do you need? And it is a speedrunning game, so also highly competitive. But this game started off as a game jam competition, didn't it? For sure. Um, so for those who don't know, a game jam is making a game very quickly in a very short amount of time. We made Mau Mau Castle in a castle in Sweden. Uh, the game jam was in a castle and we had five days to make it. 
Um, we did really well. We won best game, best music, and best graphics. So people were like, you should make this a real game. I was like, okay, we should do this. Uh, we thought it would take a year or so. It's now been three and a half years. Unfortunately, I have a day job, so I don't always have time to work on the game, but I try when I can. Um, the, the game is looking to be launched next Saturday. <laughs> oh, hear the cheers. A lot of love for Mama Castle in the house. It's probably going to be a beta launch. <laughs> Early access, exactly. Just for you guys, we're going to do an exclusive. Anyone that comes <laughs> to the Play Expo events, you will get to play the beta. How about that? It what, may also what? be available to everyone else, but we're going to put it that way. Yeah, so um, uh, if you follow me on, on social media or um, sign up to the mailing list, Asobi Tech, people know that? A S O B I Tech. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, um, I will be announcing on there when the game launches next Saturday. Next Saturday, I can see the pressure, indie dev. This is, this is a true indie dev here, you can see the pressure of terrifyingly announcing a launch date because these games are made with love and these games are made by people in their bedrooms. I mean, you're making your game with your brother um, and your t-shirt company, Pocket Pixels, which is just over there by the door for anyone that wants to check out the t-shirts we are wearing. It's with your other brother. So these are family businesses. These are things that are made with love and passion and insomnia and a small amount of madness. And they are <laughs> incredible things. So we're very lucky to have people like you in the community collecting these consoles, preserving them, letting, letting, sharing the joy of them with us, and it is all massively, massively appreciated. So you have, obviously, Pocket Pixels is over in the corner over there, if people want to check that out in a minute, and over in the main hall, you can find with the other indie games, you can have a go on Mau Mau Castle, which is absolutely an incredible game. Um, and yeah, thank you very much, Quang, for, for sharing these things with us. Your, your, hit, your collection is incredible and your contribution to this community is incredibly, incredibly appreciated. Give me so some love for Quang. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you all very much for joining us. I believe the next thing up on the main stage here will be a cosplay competition, so do stick around for that. We also have a YouTuber panel, and later on we have a game show, which you do not want to miss, and then over on the main stage there is going to be a certain gaming muso playing a musical set. Thank you very much, guys, and we'll see you all soon. Does anyone want to see or touch the things? Doesn't mean you own them, I own them. <laughs>